in a sociology class in a major university, the professor placed before all the students a values clarification situation. His thesis was the ship went down. Here's a lifeboat. On the lifeboat were five people, a male lawyer, a female doctor, a crippled child, a stay-at-home mom, and a garbage collector. This little lifeboat could handle only four, but there were five. The value clarification question was, which one would you throw overboard so that the other four could live and survive? They began to debate it. Each one took a different side of those five people, why they should be the survivor. And then they voted. I'll not tell you how the vote came out, but I'll put you in that classroom and ask you, how would you have decided these five lives, which one should be sacrificed so that the other four could live? On what basis would you make that decision? In that class, not a single person offered the Christian answer to that very important question. I hope you know what it is. All Lives are equally important under God. All lives are, have equal importance under God. That's the answer. Not a one came up with that Christian answer. Would you have been able to give that Christian witness in that context? That is the question. We have the idea that when I am good, God loves me. The truth is, God loves me and lo God loves you in order to make us good. Everybody here and all in that classroom had life. They had a biological life. They were brought into this world. They were brought in the world by a father and a mother, and that father and mother had parents, and so they were a result of a long line, a long line. It goes all the way back, 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 back to the beginning. They had biological life. All of us have biological life. How do we keep this biological life that all of us have going? It takes air, takes water, it takes food. Without air, water, and food, we shrivel up and die. And the bottom line is all of us, because if we live our biological lives out, we will all one day shrivel up and die. That's the biological life. Now, let me say, which I've said in recent months, time and time again, something that I ask people, and they still don't get it. So I want you to remember one thing. You need to remember it. It is essential to understanding life. What is your soul? Do you remember what that is? I've said that 10,000 times. Forget everything, but remember your soul is everything about you and everything about me that is not physical. That's not flesh and blood. That's your soul, your character, your spirit, your mind. That's your soul. That's my soul. Get that in your repertoire of theology. Somebody immediately says, well, I don't like theology. Theology is the science of God. Theology tells us the nature and the character of God and God's agenda for the world and for your life and for my life. Parenthetically, show me a country that is horrendous 
and I will show you a country that has a horrendous religious life. Did you get that? Some, I feel like sometime in church you sit there and say, well, I'm, we're preaching up there, and that's good. Look at all the world today. Look at all the countries that are in problem. They're in problems in directly proportion to their view of God. And, and if, if I am going to look at the moon and I have a telescope that is clear and clean and accurate, I see one moon, but if I have a telescope that the lens are cracked and it's dirty, I have a totally different picture of the moon. When those see God through false religious eyes, their lives deteriorate and the country in which they live deteriorates. So you can check out the religious emphasis of countries and nations, and you can be a prophet with unerring accuracy as to the state in which you find them. Are you keeping up? Central America, South America, Europe, Asia, America, all over the world, you see people groups, countries in SOS situations of various kinds of revolution, rebellion, economic, and all in between, moral degradation. And it's because their God, their God is not a true and picture of the Lord God Almighty. You got that? Now, we're born with biological life. We know how we sustain this biological life for three, four scores, whatever God gives to us. But there is another kind of life. I was talking to a man recently. He said, I was talking about becoming a son of God, how you become a son of God. He said, well, we're all sons and daughters of God. God is the father of everybody. And in one sense, that is accurate. That is accurate. God is the father of everybody, but in the Bible, when, he's, when we hear of God's son or God's daughter, it's different. It's not just a universal fatherhood of God. And in one sense, we are part of that. We're, we're part of nature. We're part of creation. Our parents came together. We were conceived. And in one sense, the father superintends over all of that, and so everybody in one sense is a son and daughter of God, but that is not the picture that the Bible gives us of a son and daughter of God. Learn some principles. We begat what we are. Human beings begat human beings. Human beings do not give birth. We do not beget, King James word, it means father of. We do not beget something that is not, we do not beget beavers. We beget human beings. Humans beget human beings. God begets divine being. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What is that begotten? Jesus was not created, but somewhere before time. Understand this, parentheses. Another thing you have to put in your repertoire as you study the Bible. And that is time, a beginning and an end, is created by God. There's no such thing as time. It is a, a, a period. It is created by God. So the Bible tells us before time, before nature, before there was anything that we identify as something, God begat, didn't create, his only son. God is divine. He begat that which is divine, See? his son Christ. Humans begat humans. God begets divinity. Stay with me. Jesus was sent into this world. The Christ was sent into this world and he came into this world, he had what C.S. Lewis calls Zoe. That's a different kind of life than biological life. Zoe is a divine life. So Christ entered in this world, Jesus of Nazareth. 
He brought with him divinity. He brought with him divinity, this special life, and he took upon himself biological life. Stay with me. Oh, I didn't know I was going to think this morning. I apologize. By the way, nothing is simple. Somebody, well, I just want simple religion. When a child gets on his knees by the side of his bed and prays, that's beautiful that it is simple, but my, what is going on in that prayer? How it touches heaven, God, Christ. I mean, so there's no such thing as I want simple things. Nothing is simple. All of life moves from the simple to the complex. Have you noticed that? It's easier to be two years old than it is to be 22 years old. Do you give me that? It's easier to be 22 and you're single than being 45 with four children. Move from the simple to the complex. You got that? This looks like a very simple stand, doesn't it? That's nothing complex about that. But ask the scientists what this is, and they'll talk atoms and magnetism and protons, and that seems to be a solid, but it is a solid. It gets very complex. Oh, I just like a simple understanding of God. Oh, no. We begin with simplicity, but we grow in understanding in the, remember the word, science of God, what God is about. And so we see that Jesus entered this world. He was divine, but also he was human. He had a biological life. He took upon himself a human life, but also he came with that Zoe life. This helps us understand the very heart of Christianity, the very center of Christianity. Jesus came in the world and he visited the world. He became totally a part of the world, took upon himself a biological life. So you and I and all the world who already have a biological life may somehow come and have a Zoe life, a divine life. So when we die, this body, this flesh will be gone. But what's left? Not a trick question. What's left? Tell me. Your soul, that's everything that really is you and really is me. And therefore, that soul now, if we have received Jesus Christ and taken on that Zoe, then we have a resurrection body that will be adequate for eternity and is built for eternity, the prototype being the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we, this biological form goes away, but now we have Zoe and we're equipped to live forever in heaven. That's a tremendous thing, ladies and gentlemen. That's the essence of Christianity. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. To say it another way, it's almost like that we are born, we are like statues. The earth, in one sense, using a figure here, is like a, a large place where the divine sculpture is making statues. Biological life. Christ can come into this biological life, and it can plant in you and in me Zoe, which is divine life, and that's the new birth. That's beginning again. In our biological life, in one sense, we are statues. We have life only here. But we come and receive Jesus Christ, we have a Zoe life, and that's a life forever. Do you get it? By the way, the going from a stone statue, being brought into real life is a big leap, is it not? A sculpture to a life, is that not a gigantic leap? You bet your boots it is. But it is not near as gigantic a leap as when in your life and in my life and your biological life and my biological life, when we receive Jesus Christ, he gives to us that Zoe, that divine life. And that's a bigger transition than even the transition we used in the illustration. Do you get it? It is a 
fabulous thing. So here we are, biological, alive, in the flesh for just a little while, but we receive Jesus Christ who came as the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, begotten Son, not, not created, but a Son who was begotten by the Father, and the Father begat that which was divine, and He comes and places in you and me that Zoe, which lasts forever, which animates in the future our resurrection body so we can live magnificently in heaven forever and forever. In that concept, then we have to back up and we have to ask another very serious question. Okay, you and I, biological life, we get it that Jesus was God in flesh. We confessed our sin. We turned away from our sin. We invited him to come into our life. And we're hoping that Jesus will flow his love through your life and through my life to all people. How does this take place? How does this happen? So some of us have just dried up with Zoe life in us. We haven't expressed the life of Christ through us as he has called us to do and as he has gifted us to do. One verse of the Bible I know is absolutely true. A lot of them, but this one particularly. The wages of sin is death. You say, boy, that's, that's not such a beautiful verse, but I know it's true. Because where there is sin, God is not there, right? God is not there where there is sin. So where there is sin in that situation, there will be a life that will be dysfunctional, or if a life is just simply biological, it's a life that will come to a dramatic, tragic ending a life forever alienated from God and alienated from people. So we say, how do we live this Zoe life? You say, well, where is this in the Bible? It's all the way through, but we're going to look at a guy named Timothy. We, most of us know Timothy, first and second Timothy. He was in that team that Paul put together. There was Silas, there was Peter, of course, there was Paul, and there was that whole little group, Barnabas, that really revolutionized the world of that day, and it spread all the way to this day. On that team was Timothy. And Timothy is a young guy, and Paul writes to him two letters telling Timothy how to take that Zoe life that he now has, along with his biological life that he now has, and maximize it and make it effective at that moment and that day and that age. So look what he says in 2 Timothy. Chapter number one, reading only verse 10. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life, Zoe, and immortality, to light through the gospel. You see, where there is sin, there is not God, and where there is not God, there is no light, and where there is darkness, there is no growth. So Paul is telling young Tim how you grow up, how you maximize your life, and he says Christ has come and he has brought Zoe life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have abundant Zoe, life. Do you have it? Do you feel it? Is it flowing through your body? Are you excited about today and thrilled about tomorrow and anticipating tremendously the days to come? Zoe, Zoe. And then he goes on and tells young Timothy in chapter number two, he says in verse 1, You therefore, Tim, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be strong in grace? What, what Grace is unmerited favor, simple definition. 
It's charis. It's, it's a gift. It's something God gives to us in salvation and life. He said, be strong in grace. I think this grace here deals with the spiritual gifts that you have and the spiritual gifts that I have. We receive Christ. We receive a lot of gifts. We receive, we would call it maybe talents. We call him abilities. We call him inclination. We receive gifts. We want to read some list of that. Read Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, other places in the Bible. There's a list of all kinds of gifts. Some are serving gifts. Some are all kinds of gifts, very big gifts, teaching, preaching, sharing, administrating, hospitality. But all these gifts, whatever gift you have, whatever gift mix you have, when we turn them over to God in Christ and that Zoe through the Holy Spirit activates them in your life and in my life, my goodness, we become leaders. Those who cook and have the gift of hospitality, of cooking and, and helping others who can't cook, my goodness, you become a leader with your gifts. And as we use the gifts that God has given us in the body of Christ, those gifts are multiplied. There are people in this choir when they got in 10 years ago, they had a mediocre voice. They've been singing through the years, and I can guarantee you their voice has not deteriorated. It has been enhanced because they've used that gift. Use it or lose it. And the problem is in the body of Christ, so many of us are not exercising gifts that we have because we still let the biological life take up so much of our life. And then... Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, be strong with these gifts, and then he begins to name the kind of character, the kind of life we need to develop. And he has a long list here of seven different things. I want us to look at it. Verse 2, Paul says to Tim, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you see the relay to race there? It's baton. Paul says, man, I've explained to you what it means to be a Christ follower, to be in Christ, and Christ to be in you. He said, I've explained that to you, Tim, and I pass that on to you. And Tim, you're to find other people to pass that on to them, and those people will be equipped to pass it on to somebody else. There's a four-link relay. And in teaching, there has to be discernment. I've tried to teach and pour my life into some people, and they never did get it. They didn't try. They weren't interested. They weren't on top of it. They weren't willing to pay the price. And Paul is saying, Timothy, you have to have discernment. And all of you by now know one thing. The most important thing a leader must have is discernment. He said, oh, it's got to be integrity. Oh, no, a lot of bad leaders didn't have integrity, right? Look at history. But any leader who is genuine leader has discernment. He said, Paul, use some discernment and pour into that which I poured into you and find people who can pour the truth into others. That's what we are to do. So we are to be teachers. Paul says to Timothy, he says to all of us, you're a teacher. Then, Then what else does he say? He says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You're to be a soldier. And he goes on and describes a characteristic of a good soldier. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. He said, now, wait a minute. Paul was a tent maker, but that was the way he made a living. His primary calling was to Proclaim the truth of God in Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people in my profession, my profession, what I'm called to do in the life of the church. They say, well, you know, I've got this and that and things aren't working too good. So many times they've been encumbered with business relationships. Pastors, called out people. And they get involved in business and other things, and it detracts from the central fact of who they are and their calling. I stand here today and tell you I do not have a single business relationship. I am Johnny One Note. That's what a soldier does. And if you're called to Christ, and whatever your vocation might be of tent making, that's just the way you earn a living. The way you build life is to take that Zoe and describe it and introduce others to Christ. 
Got it? That's our vocation. Everybody's vocation here is really the same. We got tent making over here. That's not it. Bam, we're to be soldiers. And a soldier that's involved in all kinds of things, they will not be effective in a war. And ladies and gentlemen, we are in a war. If you don't get that, you have my deepest sympathy. You'll be blown out of your socks one day, and you'll say, I didn't even know I was in a battle. We're to be teachers. We're to be soldiers. Then he goes on, he says, we're to be athletes. Look at it, verse 5. And if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Have you ever known a world-class athlete? You ever known one? Oh, they're really gifted. A lot of people are really gifted athletically. Oh, they're just hundreds, thousands of them. They never make it to the Olympics. They never, never make it to the high levels of athletic endeavor. Why? Because they were not disciplined. They're not on top of it. And when they get on top of it, if they lose that discipline, read the sports page, you see what happens to them. I don't care how good and how prominent they may be or how talented they may be. We're to be teachers. Timothy, we're like Timothy. We're to be teachers. Oh, yeah. And we, we're to be athletes and we're to be soldiers. And he keeps on piling on. Also, we are to be farmers, a hardworking farmer. Ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. How many of you have ever grown anything, whether it's a flower or a garden? Would you lift your hand? You've done any kind of farming, any kind of farming. Okay, hands down. You discovered something. Uh, we had a garden in our backyard almost all my life. My dad saw to it that I worked in the garden. I hated it. I realized to be a farmer, to grow something, it's hard work, right? You got to prepare the soil, get the weeds out, make sure it's fertile enough. You got to plant, you got to water, you got to wait, you, you got to prune. I mean, there's so many things involved in farming. And Jesus says, as we have these gifts, God gives us stuff in our life to use for him and employ for him. We got to be patient like a farmer. We have to be workmen like a farmer. We have to be disciplined like a farmer. And we realize like a farmer depends on God Almighty primarily for the harvest, right? And then it says a good farmer always eats the fruit of that which they have grown. There's nothing like, ladies and gentlemen, sticking my finger in the ground and putting a little tomato plant there, tomato plant which had been outside my window, came from a seed and growing and nurtured. It went out, you punch it in, you put it in, and to see that little plant begin to grow and that tomato comes and you eat a tomato that you have grown yourself. No, with the help of God and the soil and the sun and the water. We realize we're not in this thing by ourselves. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is on your life. You have Zoe in you if you receive Christ. We're to be farmers. Also, he keeps on making it more and more compounded, doesn't he? And, and finally, move down to verse number 15. Be diligent to present yourself or prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed handling the word of truth. A workman who does not need to be ashamed because in all of these areas we have given ourselves diligently, passionately, and totally that the gift that God has planted in your life and my life may bloom and may harvest and may bear fruit in the world of the 21st century. And then he keeps on getting, getting more beautiful. Verse 20, now is, a lar now is a large house that there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Verse 21, chapter 2. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, 
he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We are to be vessels. Doesn't matter if we're wood, doesn't matter if we're clay, doesn't matter if we're silver, matter if we're gold, we have to keep our vessels pure. You know what is keeping most people's vessels in which we hold these gifts from really flourishing? It's impurity. It's impurity. We live in a day in which sex has become one of our major hedonistic gods. And to keep ourselves pure in this world is a challenge 24-7 to every man and woman here if you're 90 or if you're 19 or you're 9. Purity. If God's going to use us, there has to be purity. Let me tell you something about sex. It is exclusively for marriage. Boy, we don't like that one, but that's the way it is. And our secular society has lied to us about this as we begin to slide down some kind of secular slope in which we live. And therefore, we have the light of God, and where there is darkness and light comes in, darkness always loses, right? Here's a dark place, light comes in, darkness loses. But in our culture, the light is being dimmed and dimmed and dimmed and dimmed, and therefore, we compromise especially in the area of the mind and the heart, and therefore we do not have the liberty and the joy of seeing his spiritual gifts operate magnificently in anybody's life. There's the battle. That's the front line of the battle. And he says we are to run, we are to flee, we're to purify our minds and our hearts and our motives. And then finally he summarizes all of this. <laughs> This is the bottom line of it. He says in verse 24, the Lord's bond servants must not be quarrelsome, must but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness and correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, we're to be bond slaves, bond servants. Know what that is? You remember, I hope. A slave or a servant is there under the control of the master, but a bond slave is someone who has served the master a long time and says, I want to always be your slave. And so they're taken to the doorpost of the house and they put an awl through their ear. They put a good ring there. And this is someone who has voluntarily decided to be in slavery to the master for the rest of their life. This is what we are to be. We're to go to God in Christ. We say, Lord, I come to you. I give you everything I have. I want to be your bond servant, your bond slave. And in that surrendered life, all of a sudden, things begin to happen. The zoe that we sort of dull down through the years begins to get brighter and brighter, and suddenly our words change. It says we're not to be quarrelsome. We're not to be quarrelsome. You can go to some churches, and they barbecue you in sin. Bang, 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 boom, boom, and they put a judgment trip, and a lot of people feel like they haven't been go to church unless they leave guilty. If the preacher didn't make me guilty, he didn't preach. Look, Most of us understand where we're wrong with God. We understand that. The Holy Spirit does that. We're to offer redemption when someone comes to Christ to walk out of the darkness into the brilliance of light. That's the Zoe begins to express itself even through our bios, our humanity. There's an anchor in Dallas, female, a woman, a lady. I never know what term to use. It may not be the proper one. But she's quite a gifted Christian, and she goes around sharing her witness, her faith, really all over the world. She, she's a native of Scotland, and recently she went back to Scotland, her home country, and she met with a little church in a little village, a coastal village in Scotland. And she met with some of the elders and with the old pastor, 
and, and they ask her to give them counsel as to how they could be more evangelistic, see more people come to faith in their little bitty village. And she was talking with them, and as they were talking, the, the old pastor said, remember we John. And they didn't pay any attention to him, and they went on and talked about programs and activities and fellowships and meetings and organizations they could have to bring people in. And every once in a while, the old pastor would say, remember we John. And it went on and on to find she said, wait a minute. Who is this we John? You all know who it is. Who is we John? And they tell her it was a man born and raised in the village many years. And he was a village drunk and the village thief. He said, you know, when he would get drunk, he would steal to get money so he could get drunk again. It was a vicious cycle. Get drunk, he'd steal, he'd steal, he'd get drunk. And said, anytime somebody was missing something, they'd say, probably we John stole it. And he said, we'd go to we John's house and we'd knock on the door and somebody, we John, do you have my boy's bicycle? This is Billy. And we John had come staggering out with the boy's bicycle. Somebody missed a ring. They didn't know where they lost it. Maybe we John somehow. They go, we John, this is Sarah. Do you have my ring? We John come out with Sarah's ring. This went on forever. That's how they operated. That's how they worked. One Sunday night, we John went to church. He'd never been to church. He didn't want anything to do with church. He was a drunk and a thief, a thief and a drunk. And he sat on the back row. He went hoping that the offering may have been passed and they were not watching one of the plates and he could get some real money. But unfortunately, the offering was over when he got there. And he was caught and had to go to church. And for the first time in this little Scottish village, we, John, heard about Christ who changes a life, who forgives and gives a moment of new beginning. And we, John, was overwhelmed and he half walked, half staggered down the aisle, and everybody said, well, there's we, John. What in the world is he doing now? This is a new tact he's given. But it was real to we, John. And we, John, then was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and he'd come in Sunday night, and he would sometimes bring things in a burlap bag, and he'd bring them down to the front. And he'd go over there, and he'd say, Earl, your, your weed killer, uh, weed tripper is down there in that bag. You get it after church. I brought it back to you. And then he would go and say, Mary Alice, I, I want you to know that I got all the clothes off the line in your house a couple of months ago, and, and I've got those clothes down in there in a bag after church. You go pick that up. And then sometime he would put items in the offering plate. He would, in a little church, hey, 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 I, I put this, this is yours. And this went on for months until finally one Sunday night, they were passing the plate and they came to Wee John and Wee John says, put the plate on the floor. The man said, oh no, Wee John, we can't put the plate on the floor. He said, please put the plate on the floor. And finally with tears, the usher put the plate on the floor and Wee John went and everybody's watching, little bitty church. Wee John stood in the plate and he said, Lord, I've given you drinking. I don't drink anymore. And I, I've given you back everything that I've stolen, Lord. And to be honest, in my little bungalow, I don't have anything else to give. And Lord, only thing I'm giving now, I'm standing this plate is, I give you we John. I give you all that I am and all that I will be. It's the only thing I have left. This is a big old offering plate down here. We call the altar the front of the church. Now, you're going to get distracted a little bit, but don't let that happen. Because as we sing, do you need to come wiping out all the pride and all the ego and what body will think and, cook and put yourself in the offering plate? Say, Lord, I've given some, but I want to give you all that I have that's left myself. That's when we come to Christ. That's when you've been living a biological life, a physical life, and if you haven't experienced it, God will give you that Zoe life. 
the life of Christ. That's what happened to we, John. That's what can happen to anybody here. Also, if you're here and I'm a Christian, I'm just floating around in church. I'm trying to find, you say, I want to be a part of a body of Christ. I want to get in the offering plate of this church. And I give my life through this church so God will use me in any way he wants to use me. I come and stand in the offering plate of this altar. If that's you, the Holy Spirit will let you know it.